So what's happening, YouTubers? We got games on deck here. I'm going to be starting my uh, third third uh, video for my Terminator Infinity Circle campaign. So uh, let's begin. Um, well, as you've seen in the last session, I basically went over the Earth AD uh, point two system, how it worked, and gave you a quick little rundown. Um, if you haven't checked that out, do that because this will kind of give you a. This session, I'm going to be looking a little bit more at the characters to show you what I've done for them to get them get up, you know, set up and rolling. To show you the handbook that I made here on Roll Twenty, um, and then we're going to take a look at the campaign arc that I have planned out a little bit. So um, you can see I set up all the players here. Now each player, if one of these opens up, I went through and I tried to do this for most every game to give the players some sort of jumping off point or something you know to work with in the very beginning. Some players are really creative and are able to just kind of wing it and come up with stuff, but you know if they are, then great, they can just. You know, go ahead and do that. But I just, I do try to put some stuff in there for the players to use to get things going, to get them um, in the mood of the campaign and give them an idea of what's to be expected. So I'm going to show you each of the players, and I put in three little questions in their backstory that'll kind of help um, build bonds between them or get them in character in the very beginning of the game. That's always something that's a little bit hard to do with a new character. So for one of the players here, one of his backstory things is that he has a deep-seated fascination with blank. Let me tell you about it. Now, basically, he's just going to, you know, fill in his the blank and then tell the players about it, and it's going to help build up some sort of character for him. Um, his other one is this one time while on a supply run, I saw this thing, it, and then blank. Now, I'm hoping with that one that he'll either describe some sort of um, Terminator machine that I can, you know, tweak and make up, or maybe some sort of monster if he wants to go that far, mutant of some sort. There might be something completely different. I really don't know. And that's the other thing about these is it'll give me as a GM some um, some tools to use when building this campaign. I can come back to these, look at them, and you know throw in you know if he came up with a monster that has for that part right there, I could throw in that monster later on. Or I mean I don't know if monsters will really be a part of this game, but you know the Terminator machines or something like that. And then his other one here is that he comes from pocket number in zone number now. Pockets are like little cities or little towns. Um, for the Terminator campaign, all the humans have basically took residence in the sewers and in bunkers and underground tunnels and stuff like that. In every little community that is spread out, it's called a pocket number. And a zone number is like a, think of it like a county in the United States or something similar. So you got like this big county with tons of little towns in it. And that's what it is. It's a big zone with tons of little pockets in it. So that would, you know, get some a little bit. He's probably going to be the only character that isn't from the pocket and zone that we're playing here. So he came in from somewhere else. So that will give him a bit of a background. Let's see, for the next character, it has, I have a hard time managing blank. I really don't like blank characters blank. So, you know, it could be, you know, one of the characters' mannerism. It could be a piece of clothing or anything like that. He's going to have an issue with it. So it'll kind of create a little bit of a... Uh, Character strife, nothing, you know, that's bad, but gives him a little bit to work with again. And he carries around a book called Blank. It has a lot of life lessons to learn from. You know, maybe it's Huckleberry Finn or something like that. We'll see. And let's see what else we got. This character here, this character actually started a little bit of his character sheet and stuff, so you have to ignore that for the time being. But one of his, he has a scar, says, oh man, that was a doozy, let me tell you about it. And then the character can go on and talk about it. Um, one of George's characters had the question that he saw something. The character also said it. He says, yeah, I saw that too, but... And, you know, he tells his version of the story. And he tends to blank when he gets stressed out. And for the last one... This one would be in response to Kalen's character of what he doesn't like about a character... And, you know, um, Twitch's character would be like, yeah, I don't like that either, but, or, and, or something of the sort. Because it might very well be, when Kalen, you know, answers that question, it might be with Twitch's character. And so it would be a re personal reply response as compared to a agree or disagree sort of response to somebody else. Um, you once saw John Connor. It's, you know, whether a player embellishes this, makes it a huge story or not, or if it's true or not, we don't really know. We'll find out. And he can't imagine blank. This could be like a world without love or, you know, whatever it might be, something. And, you know, the basic idea here is, you know, to get the characters or get the players in character, get them talking in the beginning of the game and helping them uh, 
try to visualize and build this character from scratch. And I always found, you know, as a player, that it's just a lot easier just to grab a few questions and just answer them, and that starts to really get your mind thinking. You know, it's sort of like some of the other games I've done that have a random character generation. You throw in these different connections and this different character with all these different things, and you have to somehow build something out of that and connect the dots and create something. That's sort of what this does. It just gets the players thinking, gets them in the mood for the game, and, you know, gives me as a GM some tools to come back on and use. Um, backstory has always seemed to be something that's a little more difficult for players, you know. They don't want to fill out all that information, and they don't really want to think about it, which is perfectly fine. But when I have something to work off of as a GM with the players, and I'm able to bring those characters and um, basically use what they give me, it, gives, it creates a bigger immersion for the players. And, you know, it makes them feel good that the spotlight's kind of on them at the moment. So... I went through all the character sheets and did that and got those set up. Um, I created the handbook, which is pretty much done. All the different little bits about the campaign has a link to the rule book for everybody to use. Um, character creation. Now, all my players are recommended to download the book, you know, and uh, over at Drive Through RPG or RPG Now. Um, they are other the other players are DMs as well, occasionally your players, and you know, I always try to push the book as well. But some, in some cases, they do need the books to start stuff. So I did give them a link to the book that I have. And it's just shared with in-house, you know, to get everybody playing and rolling. Uh, specific, or, yeah, specific links to each of the different things it talks about them. So if they click on abilities, it brings up a table about the ability so they know what each one does and what it is. And then the same thing through, you know, they can click into gimmicks and it has all the gimmicks that they need for the game. All right there at a quick click of a button. And weapons, stocks... Um, and then the setting information I went through and I wrote up what the setting's all about in the sections, you know, what they knew about things, what's going on. That same thing here with the character or the background details. It's basically everything that they know up to this point. And let's see what they know about Skynet. Basic details there about Skynet. Um, important NPCs I haven't filled out yet. I see one of the ones I have over here is Colonel Briggs. He's going to be the colonel of their pocket. Now, each pocket basically has some sort of colonel or some sort of leader that has been appointed by John Connor, personally, to run that pocket. Um, John Connor is quite, um, I mean, he's very powerful in this game, not stat-wise, but very knowledgeable and, you know, a highly regarded figure. So generally his assumptions or who he appoints, he knows well, and he, do, he doesn't just throw somebody into a position kind of thing. So there really isn't an issue with the leaders and the leaders, you know, overtaking these pockets and being like harsh dictators or anything like that. Those are actually called vulture gangs, but I'll get to them in a moment. And then I put in the Terminator notebook for the PCs, and basically as we go through, I'm going to put in a bunch here that the PCs know, like the T100 and the T800 and so on and so forth. And as the players encounter new Terminator machines or hunter killers or aerial units, mobile units of sorts, they can put in, I'll give them, you know, I'll let them know what it's called or I'll let them name it if I really want to. But that way they can kind of start keeping notes on the different types of units, their strengths, their weaknesses, what they know about them so that they can get on running so that, you know, when they come across something, they know the best way to defeat it or deal with it. And like I said, I'm going to put a bunch in there to start them out with because all the players are already... Um, established soldiers or tech cons or you know some sort of role and they do know some of the terminators already and that is about it so um, you know this is a great little uh, feature of roll 20 I'm generally not a fan of tags and the wiki style formatting however as this little handbook works out it, it does work out really really well and I might actually create a separate video on how I create these um, it's really, really simple. It's just extremely useful to set up the players with. So let's get to the arcs. Now, campaign arc. Man, these are like the baned DMs at times, I guess. Um, I've always had a really hard time trying to give the players some sort of starting position. And then creating this arc to an ending position. And I... I guess it's because I hate to railroad the players. I don't want them going from point A to point B to point C to point D and finishing the campaign. I want them to be able to kind of move around and do stuff all in the middle and then finally ending with this main campaign arc. And keeping a 
campaign on track without railroading the players is very hard. Um, it takes a lot of getting used to. And, you know, I still find myself at times pushing players in a certain direction and I have to scold myself for it. So I go about creating arcs in the same way I do a campaign session. And I use basically this three-tier system. And uh, this sort of gives the players a sense of freedom or sandbox style play because they can hop around and do different things while still keeping this basic route from point A to point D to accomplish the campaign arc. Now, the players do realize that this campaign is going to take place pre the Terminator 1 movie. Um, it's going to take place in 20, 29 AD, and the players are going to be working up to whatever point it is that Skynet and the Resistance sent their respectable heroes, or whatever you want to call it, back in time. So the players are going to start, you know, like a month or so before the Terminator 1 movie starts. Um, well, you can see the three arcs I have here. We have Arc, Resistance versus the Infiltrators. We have the Arc, Resistance versus Vultures. And we have the Arc, the Resistance versus Skynet. Now, the main story arc really is going to be based around the Resistance versus the Skynet, because as you'll see, these two arcs actually incorporate Skynet. But the players won't directly recognize that or realize that right away. And, and when the game begins, they're going to end up being more like in this versus the infiltrators. And then it's going to move into the vultures and then I'll move into Skynet from there. So they're kind of following these three um, arcs. And they all tie in together, as you'll see. But if the players don't follow through and finish this one and they decide to move on and deal with the vultures, that's perfectly okay. Because um, they will end up having to backtrack and deal with the infiltrators at one point or another, probably. And, you know, again, if they don't deal with the vultures, they decide to deal with the infiltrators and they get information on Skynet and they hop right on over to the Skynet. Um, as they start going through different scenes that make up that arc, they're going to have to end up dealing with the vultures at some point. So while they could just run off and do something completely different, everything kind of comes back and they have to deal with things at some point or another. So... Those are the three arcs. Each arc is split into four or five scenes, and these are um, basically things that I as a GM are going to be doing in the background and during play to push the story forward. These are the main four or five things that are need to be done to accomplish the goal of that arc. As a GM, I take on the role of the Infiltrators, the Vultures, and Skynet. Um, these scenes are written from my point of view and, you know, from the infiltrators or whatever point of view to succeed in what they're trying to do. So, for example, in the resistance versus the infiltrators, they're going to take on the role of the infiltrators. What they want to do is break into these pockets, infiltrate them, take out the important people, eventually take out the kernel of that pocket, replace it with one of their own uh, T-1000s or infiltrator terminator units, and take control over that pocket. And then from there... They just, you know, release how they bring in more Terminators, they slot them, they do whatever they need to do to wipe out that pocket. And that's how Skynet is able to infiltrate all these different little pockets. You know, these little towns, he goes in, or, you know, the Skynet, the AI, goes in, infiltrates it, builds its, um, the Terminator builds its reputation within that unit, gains enough power to wipe it out. So, for the infiltrator scene, the infiltrators are going to start out Assassinate two important pocket. Pocket 72 is the pocket that the players are in. Yes, their home base. So the infiltrators are going to assassinate two important members who had information of some sort. This is going to be started probably right off the bat in the game. Um, the players are going to be called into like the colonel's office to check out what's going on and you know why the couple uh, major important role people are dead or you might hire the PCs on to do something. You know something along those lines. But from the infiltrator's point of view, they're going to assassinate two important members. From there, they're going to work their way into the resistance with the intention to sabotage missions. This could be, you know, the, um, now when I say infiltrator, there might be one, there might be five, there might be 20. It depends on the, how the campaign goes and if I wanted to narrow it right down to one or if I think there should be more. So that's, you know, variable. 
But basically, the infiltrators are going to try to get into the wrist resistance from a um, soldier point of view or attack or some sort of get into those army units so that when those army units go off and um, are battling Skynet and taking on missions of some sort, those infiltrators could sabotage them. They might, you know, have a stray bullet kill somebody that was important. They might alert the other T units. They, you know, they're going to do something to sabotage that mission so it fails. Thus, they're going to start uh, wiping out little divisional units of the armies one by one. Now, next step is the, or the infiltrator sabotage a major mission, resulting in the death of multiple divisions. Some or save some lives and move up in ranks. So what it is, is basically going to have some sort of mission that goes really bad somehow. Um, and when that mission goes bad, these infiltrator units are going to sort of be the heroes of the day, you know, saving a very important person's life, getting information that, um, you know, that was supposed to be found out or learned or whatever, back to the unit or whatever. Whatever they can do to up themselves in rank, basically. So once... They get back, you know, there's going to be less soldiers, less of a resistance going on. Everything's going to be in scrambles. The colonel's going to want to... Obviously, he's going to take measures, and so are the players, to try and get people, the right people to move up ranks. But that's the whole point of the infiltrators, to try and get up the ranks. So they're going to do whatever they can. And by doing that, it's going to push, you know, the infiltrators higher up in the ranks, and so that they have more power within this resistance. The next one down is the infiltrators, or the infiltrators successfully take out Colonel Briggs. That's the Colonel for the Pocket 72. One of them takes up position until General John Connors can refill the position. Now, like I said, um, John Connors appoints the colonels to these pockets. And being as revered as he is, for lack of a better term, he does very well on managing his colonels, knowing who's good, who's bad. He doesn't let things get out of hand. He, he makes sure that he picks the right people for the right job. So one of them is going to take up the position, just an interim sort of position, until John Connors can do something. So they're kind of going to lead the way during that time. They're going to try and do as much good as they can, but they're still going to work on sabotaging the missions and making sure that nothing really bad happens to Skynet. And the final step for this is that a T-1000 disguised as John Connors is going to show up, appoint that infiltrator as the official colonel, and that's when all hell's going to break loose. Um, there are T-1000 infiltrator units that look like John Connor. This is the way that, you know, at the point of this campaign taking up or starting, most of the players and most of well, the players, ain't, well, the characters in general and the NPCs and everybody don't really realize this yet. Um, they are, they have come across infiltrator units that look, look like humans and act like humans, but they haven't came across any that mimic a specific human. They're basically going to be T-1000 units like um, in Terminator 2, this one that can change its form to look like all different people or whatever. So that is the basic scenes for this arc. The characters are going to have to kind of go from scene to scene. At any one point, they might be able to stop this whole arc from happening, at which point it would kind of move on to another arc or something. But they could stop. They're probably not going to stop this very first one because I'm thinking this is what I'm going to use to start the campaign with. But once they find out, they might decide to do some um, investigative work at this point, and they might find out who their infiltrators are, and they could end up with this, you know, this one right here. Or if they decide to do something else, or they're not able to find out in time, it'll move on. At any one of these points, these scenes, the players can kind of stop things from happening by doing something. And if that's the case, then it'll end up stopping there and it wouldn't be able to go any further because the infiltrators would be gone. And down here in the GM notes, I got a little bit of notes uh, for me just to keep things on track. Um, basically saying that, you know, through the failed missions, collection of data and other sources, Skynet has located Zone 34 and Pockets. It was 71 through 86, which are the Pockets are the little towns within that zone community. Um... I spelled salt wrong. They Skynet basically uses the same tactic, which could be a very big boon for the players and the NPCs if they decide to look into this a little bit. But Skynet uses the same basic tactic when trying to wipe out these zones of infiltrating them, um, the infiltrators gaining ranks, and then unleashing a war on these small pockets. So he, he, a, that basically, Skynet really hasn't learned to deviate from the path because it has worked for so long so far that it hasn't adapted to something new that the human resistance would do.
So it's just staying on that same path until there's a reason to change. Let's see. And then, then, you know, it just talks about if the missions fail, if, you know, the infiltrator missions fail, how things move along into the different areas. Now, the resistance versus vultures. Vultures are like, think of them like biker gangs or uh, brigands and, you know, people who are out to survive at any cost. They're not necessarily with the resistance. They're not interested in fighting the machines. Um, their only interest is to survive at any cost. If that means they have to go and wipe out pockets and kill people to take their stuff, then they'll do it. If that means they have to break into, you know, in one of Skynet's labs for stuff, they'll do it. They do whatever they need to do to survive. And for the resistance, that's a bad thing because it's not uncommon for these vultures to move out, you know, put a setup base outside of a pocket and start attacking that pocket eventually wearing it down to nothing and then going in, looting it, destroying, killing whatever they need to kill and taking their goods to survive longer then moving on to another pocket. They're, they're basically just kind of like savages. They're not looking to stay in one place. They're not looking to build a, you know, any sort of permanent base or expand. They're just moving from place to place to place to survive. Now, let's see. So a pack of vultures sets up base just a short travel outside of pocket 72. Depending on where the game begins and what the players do, they might learn about this quick. But basically, we have the player pocket set up, and then outside of that, the vultures are going to kind of start setting up base. Now, they could be able to find out in time and stop them from setting up a little base to actually do anything with. But if not, then things move on a little next step. The vultures begin harassing the pocket 72 locals. These are like the outskirts, you know, the side tunnels and stuff. They might come in and, you know, jump a family that is eating dinner kind of thing and take all their stuff and then get out. And they'll just start harassing whoever's either traveling outside of that or coming in. Um, any patrols of soldiers that happen to go out, they will try to jump and kill. Thus, they're able to amass weapons, um, soldier gear, you know, um, health packs, adrenaline shots, guns, ammo, weapon, other weapons, armor, whatever they might need to, and, you know, help them survive. At that point, once they start to amass more weapons, more um, gear that they need, they'll start to uh, expand a little bit doing more riskier raids, trying to take more from the pocket. In which case, you know, they do small raids on Pocket 72. They'll take slaves, um, meaning anybody that they're able to capture alive, and they will implant them with cybernetic brainwashing chips, basically, to get those people as mindless slaves, who, in turn, they will outfit with the gear, send in to, as the cannon fodder, distractions, whatever they need to do. To further try to take over this town. Now, the cybernetic brainwashing really just leaves these people as zombies. I mean, they're not going to be infiltrating or taking notes and spying or anything like that. They're completely, pretty much brain dead. They just follow whatever order they're given until they're given another order. And then the last step is this the vultures make a large scale assault on Pocket 72, blasting tunnels, closing routes, and filling the chambers with smoke and emission gases. They raid, loot, and move to a new pocket. So they're basically going to start blowing the tunnels that lead into this pocket, filling the pocket with uh, fire, or with gas, um, smoke, whatever they can do to kill everybody. And then once everything's done and cleared out, they'll clear the rubble a little bit, go in, take what they want, and then they head to a new pocket. Um, little notes about this. Basically, Skynet knows the vultures exist, but it doesn't care because... For you know, 99% of the time, these vultures are not messing with the machines and Skynet. They're just doing what they need to do to survive. Once in a while, it might cross over, but most of the time, it's not. And Skynet has further um, assured that they're not messing with the AI by infiltrating the vultures unit. Now, the vultures often know that they have T-1000 units or you know other infiltrator units within their gang, but they really don't care. Because Skynet doesn't worry about the vultures since they're not actively warring with each other. Eventually, Skynet does want to destroy all human life and it will wipe them out. But, as it is right now, Skynet uses them as a tool. They can infiltrate these vulture gangs. They will push one of their infiltrators to the gang leader. And then he, that vulture unit, Skynet will use to move around and destroy pockets. 
And so it's kind of a tool for Skynet. And like I said, the vultures themselves generally don't care about being infiltrated because the machines are leaving them alone. They're helping them get supplies they need to survive. And they're, you know, they're extending their life. You know, they're surviving by the help, really, of Skynet and these infiltrator units. Plus, the infiltrators are such badass Terminator machines that it gives the vultures a good edge in actually succeeding in what they're trying to do. So, at each one of these points, the players could get involved and try to stop the vultures from succeeding, destroying this pocket. And if they do, things would move on again. Or they might move back if they decided to sidetrack from figuring out who the infiltrators are and deal with the vultures. So, in the beginning of the game, they're mainly going to be focusing on trying to figure out the infiltrators and dealing with the vultures. It's going to be like a constant back and forth. You know, maybe they'll just follow one route. But if they... Uh, focus too long on one thing, then these other, these scenes begin to pick up and I'll mark these off as they're happening so that, you know, between, say, session one, two, and three, they're focusing on the infiltrators and things are going through. In session four starts, I might tell them, you know, that recently a pack of vultures was found outside the um, pocket, or a group of vultures was found outside the pocket, and that they have been harassing soldiers and taking ammunition and weapons and gear. So then, you know, this one's already been done and they're already in the process of doing the second scene. So it's a way, able to, way to get the players to hurry up with their arc or to move on to a new arc or to kind of move around and do different things. It gives them different options. All right, so the last arc is the, actually the Resistance vs. Skynet. Now, this one won't really come into play until the players um, force Skynet's hand into moving to this arc or they deal with these arcs in some sort of way. Skynet doesn't look to, I don't want to say spend money because it's really not spending money, but the time and the energy that it takes for them to, well, this one right here, basically what they're doing is they're going to move a terraforming machine into the zone where these pockets are. Terraforming machines will clear out the land and get it ready for building, and then it will begin building a mobile factory T unit, which is basically this big factory on wheels that pumps out T units left and right, and gets them ready to, for a full-scale war. Skynet doesn't want to do that unless it's absolutely forced to do it because it is a lot of time and energy put forth to build these mobile form, you know, these mobile factory units and to get things in at that point level. That's like a last resort sort of thing. So it Skynet isn't going to take that unless it's either forced its hand by the players, you know, infiltrating or trying to attack Skynet in some way, or it's out of options. So like I said, it's going to send a terraforming machine in. It's going to, to zone 34, which is the player's zone. It'll be construction of a mobile factory unit. The players would find out about this probably. It's pretty big, huge undertaking for Skynet to do. So they would have time to try and do something about it. If they aren't able to do anything in time, the next step is that the T-unit assembly begins. Future killer command units, which are FKCs, set patrols, keep watch, send data, and begin preparations. These are like huge... Um, flying islands almost of machinery with cameras and guns and infrared units and data processors that constant, keep a constant watch on what's going on around this terraforming in this mobile factory unit so that, you know, it's able to judge the best of, you know, where the human resistance is emerging from for the bunkers, you know, where they're coming out of, where they're hiding, is able to try and get information on what they're doing. Anything that's able to gather it will do. And they all just, they're probably going to two or three of these basically just circling this mobile factory unit in this whole area. So again, the players could kind of get up there, try to take out these FKCs, and then try to try break into the mobile factory unit or some other plan at this point. The third scene is going to be that the T-unit army is put online. The Terra drills, which are TD-55s, begin penetrating Zone 32 bunkers, and the T-units move out. This would be, you know, after the future killer command units get the information they need to um, send out these T units and uh, declare war basically on the human resistance. It's going to flip all the switches for these terminator units, put them all online, give them their guns, and send them out. Terra drills are like giant drills that drill into the ground, breaking through steel and bunkers and whatever happens to be between the ground level and where these um, pockets are in the bunkers. It's going to drill in those holes, and then the T units are just going to pile in, get onto the underground things, and just wipe everybody out. 
And that's actually what the scene four is. Is it scene that zone 32 falls under full scale assault from Skynet? It's called Operation Pocket Zone Genocide Part 12. Why Part 12? Because the other 11 already succeeded. So, and then in my GM notes, I basically talk about how if either of these two arcs fail, it moves into this arc, and how, you know, Skynet doesn't want to waste the time and the energy to do this unless it absolutely has to. So, that's it. This is going to be my campaign. Now, each little scene really makes up the basis of an adventure. Um, as I said, I kind of wing things every game. I try not to prepare too much. Um, my game is actually tomorrow night. I don't know if I'll have time to do another video for that, for my preparation for that game or not. If I do, I'll show you. If not, I'll kind of do a backtrack. We'll end up having the game, and then I'll, when I do my next video, I'll kind of do a backtrack, show you what I did to prep for that game, and then how it fit into the campaign. But either way, I'll show you a adventure prep or a session prep of what I plan, which I will be hopefully doing that, studying that out tonight, I think. As long as I have time. Um, I do session preps or, you know, adventure games in the same three-tier format. Um, and it allows me to fill up, um, how do you want to say it? It gives me a way to let the players move from adventure point to adventure point in options, sort of sandboxy style, while still keeping them on the same basic end, just like I'm doing here. You know, they're able to move around and do what they want to do, but they still follow that same line. And my adventure preps are work the same way. Um, like I said, I'll have to do a video on it, but, you know, as a, just a real quick a little example, as I said, I'm probably going to start with this one here. The infiltrators assassinate two important Pocket 72 members to add information. And with that said, my first um, session might be prepped out for if they decide to do an investigation into this. Or maybe they're going to try to, um, you know, do like some patrols outside of the unit and trying to get information outside somehow. Or maybe I'm probably going to throw in like one other random NPC that's trying to get them to do something else. So it gives them a little way to move around and do different things. But in the end, all those three little side adventures within this one big adventure kind of lead back to the same point of whatever it was they're trying to do. At the same time, it might allow them to branch off. Um, I really haven't planned out a whole lot for my game tomorrow night, so you know I'm just trying to brainstorm. But you know, in my next video, I'll show you what I planned out, how I did it, and, um, get things going on that. I think that's it for the story arcs. Um, I'll print this out. I'll stack it on my wall right here, so as we're playing the game, I can always look over, check things off, get an idea of what's going on, and get this campaign moving. Look forward to having a great bunch of time. Um, like I guess uh, the uh, Roll20 games are going to be posted online for everybody to watch, so I'd love some feedback. I know my biggest weakness as a DM is working with NPCs. I'm horrible at NPCs. I, I mean, I can get their quirks off, and I can get them the information they need for the players, but actually portraying an NPC I have a hard time doing for some reason. I just don't have that vocal range for different voices or the acting ability to pull off quirks and stuff, so... This game I've decided is going to be my my focus on being an NPC and really busting ass to try and pick up my game at that spot. But I'm getting off on a tangent, so I'll let you guys go do whatever you do. And thank you for watching. It's been great. Hopefully you got something out of this, and I'll see you soon. Keep rolling the dice.